Today we have with us Rupa Pai Ma'am. Rupa Ma'am is one of India's best known writer for children. This Bangalore-based author has written over 25 books, ranging from picture books to chapter books and fiction to non-fiction on themes as varied as sci-fi fantasy, popular science, math, history, economics, Indian philosophy, life skills, and most recently, medicine. Many of her books are bestsellers and are enjoyed as much by adults as by children. Her best known books, include the eight-part Tara Knots, India's first fantasy adventure series for children in English. Ready 99 must-have skills for the world-conquering teenager and almost teenager. The award-winning national bestseller, The Geeta for Children, listed by Amazon India as one of 100 Indian books to read in a lifetime. And it's Perkwell, The Vedas and Upanishads for Children. Her TEDx talk, Decoding the Gita, India's Book of Answers, has received over 1.5 million views to date. Her most recent book for children is Lichis to Slug Glue, 25 explosive ideas that made and are making modern medicine. She has also co-authored fitness evangelist and supermodel Milind Soman's memoir, Made in India, and is currently working on a book of poetry translation in which she's translating 100 poems of the much acclaimed Kannada poet Padma Shri K. S. Nisar Ahmed into English. When she's not writing, Rupa Ma'am can be found leading groups of children and young people on history and heritage walks across her beloved Karnataka as a part of her job as director of a company and co-founder of Bangalore Walks. Hello, ma'am. Hi, good, hi, good, great. Okay, so start with sharing with us something about your childhood. What got you initially interested in writing? Did you get any formal course for it? Um, okay, so basically, I was just, I think I've just been one of those lucky ones who always knew that they wanted to write. Uh, I don't think there was anything in particular. There was no certain point at which I suddenly realized I wanted to be a writer. I think it gradually grew on me the idea and mainly because I think I was such a compulsive reader. I used to read such a lot that uh, I think uh, it, it seemed to me that there could be nothing more joyous than writing. And I found that I was able to express myself well in writing. And I think even before I decided that I wanted to have a career as a writer or I wanted to be a writer, writing was just the way I expressed myself. So if I went on a trip with my parents, I would come back and write a little journal about it. What I saw, what happened. That Amazing. Kind of yeah, uh, uh, anything that moved me, I would write a poem about it, but it is not really a poem, but it is like worse, you know, just rhyming things. But anything that affected me or moved me in a particular way, whether positively or negatively, I would write, up, write about it. So I think as time went on, I realized, oh my God, I really enjoy this writing and people would appreciate it. And I was like, huh, okay, so this is this is good. I think this is what I'm going to be. And luckily that instinct, which I felt about writing, that it was what I wanted to do in my life, that hasn't uh, proved wrong. Uh, and I'd like to tell kids that they must trust their gut instincts. You know, uh, don't get, um, just because somebody else or the world or uh, somebody, you know, everybody tells you that that is no use and this, you know, if you're a CEO of a company, then only you're something. If you're an IAS officer, only then you're something, you know, so don't get swayed by what people tell you. Listen to your gut. Uh, that's how I got into writing. Just, that is so wonderful. So <laughs> you just mentioned that you really loved reading. So what were your favorite books as a child? Like, what did you read the most? I think... Enid Blyton, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s, uh, 70s and 80s, we, India, in, in, children in India didn't have access to a lot of foreign books at all. And there wasn't much Indian writing in English, for
for children. And we were all English medium kids, urban kids. And uh, even though, of course, we spoke our mother tongues at home, I certainly thought and dreamt in English. That was my first language, you know. So uh, even though my family is very Kannadiga, of course, I can speak Kannada fluently. I read a lot of Kannada, all that. But still, my preferred language of expression was English. Uh, so among English books then, um, the, the kinds, the books that were most easily available to us in circulating libraries, because you must remember this is 70s and 80s, our parents didn't have so much disposable income that they could buy us books. Like today's parents can easily buy, like I have bought my children so many books without thinking. But our parents had a limited amount of uh, funds and they had to divide it amongst, you know, house rent or car EMI or, uh, you know, things like that. And books were only a small part. But luckily for us, when I was growing up in Bangalore, as in every other Indian city, there was this concept of circulating libraries and every neighborhood had a couple of them and their shelves would be stocked and we all became members of those libraries. There was also a city central library near my house that we were members of. So there were a lot of these libraries. So even if your parents couldn't afford to buy you books, you, could, you certainly had access to a lot of books. Um, and these circulating libraries, what the kinds of books they had determined what we read. Right, because th that was what we had access to. Yeah, we, did, we didn't have Amazon that we could order from and all that. So whatever was available, that's all on those shelves. And what they stocked the most for children was Enid Blyton books. Uh, this British author. Yeah, called Enid amazing. Blyton. Yeah, so so I ended up reading a lot. So what else was there for children or for uh, yeah, teenagers? There were Enid Blyton books, and then you graduated to. Uh, Nancy Drew, which was like a mystery series with a girl detective. And then if you were a little more tomboyish, you went to Hardy Boys, which is about two brothers, the Hardy Boys who also solved mysteries. And then there was Alfred Hitchcock and the three investigators, like Alfred Hitchcock introduces the three investigators. So that was even a little higher uh, than that. So these were the kinds of series, mostly they had series, these kinds of books. And when you became 12 or 11, 12, you started reading. This was British. And then there was Americana. Americana was available to you in terms of Archie Digests. Okay, not, yeah. not so much American literature as we have now for young adults and children. We had, no, no, we didn't have a Dr. Seuss. I never read a Dr. Seuss until I was a full grown adult. But there was uh, always Archie's, Archie comics. So that told us, that mm -hmm. gave us an impression of what America was like, you know, diners and sodas and Riverdale and college romances, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we had Archie's and from the Indian uh, side, my favorite, favorite books, which was again, the favorite books of everybody in my generation was Amanchitra Katha, the mythological, historical, I agree. and I... they were coming out when I was young. So we could okay. wait for the next title. It was still quite new the concept so it was coming out so we would wait for the next title and collect them and I think every kid that I knew had in their homes bound cop because they were flimsy in the sense the uh, covers would tear and all with too much usage so eventually the parents would go to a book binder and get 10 or 20 of them bound 10 I think and we everybody had these bound copies of 10 10 comics uh, in their shelves so wow. these were my uh -huh. The other one, so there was British, there was American in terms of archetypes, there was Indian in terms of historical, mythological. And the other big influence in my childhood was Russian books, which are, which are impossible almost to access now for today's children. But Russian children's books was a huge area at that time because India and Russia had a friendship going on. So they would send us a lot of books and uh -huh. Russian books were very, very cheap. Beautiful hardcover books, fabulously produced, great illustrations, great writing. Uh, and they would be, I, I can't even remember, I don't know anymore how, but I don't think more than 15, 20 rupees per book. And like giant big books, hardcover books, beautiful books, and what they would be Leo Tolstoy's like great literature, Leo Tolstoy's stories for children, and that kind of. So it taught us about you know we came to know that uh, Russian kids had names like Masha and Vasily and 
uh, Misha and uh, Yuri, and you know, so we knew that these were the Russian kids that they had names like that. We learned about nice. the communist system, how they all lived on a collective nice. farm, and we learned about Baba Yaga, who's the witch in in the Russian books. She's the witch, like of Russian mythology, and she lives in a forest in a house that stands on a chicken leg. And go and interesting. <laughs> <laughs> These were my big influences in my childhood as far as books go. Clearly, you were a big time reader. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Also, you mentioned that, um, you know, today and maybe even in your time, there are people saying that this is of no use, this career is of no use. Did you have any such people, you know, saying you that writing books and becoming an author is not a good career. It won't give you much profit. Yeah, yeah, my own parents. So oh. South Indian middle-class parents of my generation, uh, like unless you're a doctor or an engineer, there's no hope for you. You will end up on the dung heap. No uh -huh. other profession earns you any money. And it can be a hobby, but it cannot be a profession. Uh -huh. Did you so, convince so, them? I didn't. I did engineering. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> you did computer engineering. Yeah, so I became a computer engineer. I couldn't convince them. And especially if you also were bright academically and you were able to get the marks, then they would certainly not listen to you. Like maybe if you were failing spectacularly in science, then they might have let me go for something else. But uh, I, I was not bad at science at all. So then they were like, no, no. But you, then my mom said, then she used the feminist argument on me that you know i want all my girls to be professionally qualified so that in a bad time they can depend on themselves to be financially independent they won't need to depend oh on a husband and all that so you have to do engineering but after that you do what you like i just want you to have that degree so that i know that you are taken care of for life so i could not really argue with that one didn't argue with our parents so much at that time. So, so, so I did engineering. But the moment I finished, I gave her my degree and said, now you can put it in, in your puja room and do puja to it because I am off to write. So, so and, and I didn't ever have a job in engineering. I finished my engineering and I uh, moved to Delhi and I took a job with a magazine called Target, a children's magazine and started working. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how was your experience so with fact, Target? Yeah, so in fact, the story of how I came to know Target and all that is also very interesting. So, you know, I told you how I used to read British books all the time. Yeah. And they, these kids always seem to be having the most glorious fun. They were always going on picnics. They were cycling away. They were catching criminals, you know, and they were just always by themselves. And they never were any adults in sight. And my childhood was just packed with adults. Oh my God, like, you know, so many aunts, uncles, grandparents, and every auntie would think that she's your mom and she had the right to tell you what to do and how to behave. So there were so many of them. So I grew up thinking that only British children had cool childhoods and my childhood sucked. Like, you know, so, that, and I, I could never be alone. I could never even dream of going on a picnic just with my friends and with no adults around, like there was no way. Uh, I think children today have much more freedom like that, you know, because we, we have phones, yeah, and we have phones and we can, we, we can track you, I mean, we can, we can find out where you are, when yeah. you're coming, but in those days, you just send them away, you just send them away, like where, right. you didn't know where they were, yeah, so also, I think, it depended on the kinds of parents you had, I think my parents were particularly, uh, they really cocooned us, so the, we, we didn't get to go anywhere uh, by ourselves. So, uh, yeah, so I kept thinking that they had the most fun childhoods. And of course, Amar Katha was there, but uh, it felt like Amar Katha was always harking back to some glorious past and with Apsaras, Devas, yeah. Asras, not, no connection with my life at all. So the only children I read about in books seem to be British children, and they always seem to be having fun. And when we went on family picnics, on a picnic, not family picnic, any picnic, it would always be 20 people in an ambassador car going somewhere that we already know, a park that we know already, rolling out I the mats, that. the badminton rackets coming out. And when it became lunchtime, it would always be lemon rice and curd rice. 
And I'm like, what kind of a picnic is this? You know, it's so boring. I'm not, I'm not opening up tins of sausages and having fresh tomatoes and gingerbread and scones with clotted cream and strawberry jam. No, I'm having none of that. I'm having this boring food. It's really bad. And I kept thinking like this until I was about 13 and I came across Target magazine. Target had been around since I was nine, but I came across it only when I was about 13. And it was a magazine that came out from Delhi. It was a children's magazine, part of the India Today group. And it had such beautiful stories in it, short stories with great illustration. And all those stories were about Indian children who seemed to have lives exactly like mine, except in the stories, the way they were presented, they seemed to be having a lot of fun. And I thought <laughs> okay. to myself, okay, maybe I've been looking at this all wrong. And the switch flipped in my head and I said, actually, you have a very wonderful life. And because Enid Blyton wrote about boarding school so much, I wanted to go to boarding school. And sitting, based, being at home and going to school didn't seem like fun at all. So all these things. But when I read Target, I said, wait, I think actually this is a fun life. I just haven't been, I haven't realized this. And I thought to myself, if I'm not eating out of tins, and in fact, I'm eating... Uh, lemon rice and curd rice, which is still warm, in fact, then it must be because there were enough people who cared about me enough to wake up in the morning and cook it. So maybe it's not such a bad thing to have such a big family and so many nurturing adults who cared about you. you know, so I just started looking at everything very differently. That's so sweet. Uh, <laughs> and then when I grew up even more, uh, I, when I began to study about the history of England and all, I realized that Enid Blyton was writing in a time after the Second World War, between the First and Second World Wars and after the Second World War. So during the wars, children in England, particularly, were sent away to the country, away from London, because London was the target of bombing uh, by the Axis forces, uh, you know, Germany oh, yeah, and yeah. Our allies. London was the target. And so fathers were away at war, mothers were helping out in hospitals, rolling up bandages, taking care of the ill, and children were sent away to eccentric relatives or anybody who would have them in the countryside, saying that you, you keep them because they'll be safer there. And yeah. that's why the stories were all set in the countryside and children without adults. Okay. And in fact, it was a very traumatic period for children because they're separated from their parents. They were with some strange person who didn't really care about them. And they were always living in fear that when they went back, maybe their parents would be dead. Maybe their homes would be gone. They had no idea. So it was actually a very scary time. So to make it, to romanticize that for children and say that, no, look at the country. It's a great place. The sun is always shining. You're having a great time. That's why those stories were written in that tone. Like it's so wow. much fun to be in the country. And the reason... Also, that there are so many boarding schools, boarding school stories out of England. Even Harry Potter at the end of it, at the core of it, is a boarding school story. And why British authors keep writing about boarding school stories is also because at that time, when the parents were away at war or they were serving in India or something like that, the children would be sent to boarding schools. And again, it was not fun, but you had to make it sound as if boarding school was so much fun so that the kids could then be calm and enjoy Interesting. themselves. Yeah. So when I read all the, so anyway, so I read Target Magazine when I was 13 and I was like, oh God, this is so fun. And uh, I haven't realized that I'm actually having a very wonderful life. And that's when I thought to myself, even though I always knew I wanted to write, Target made me realize that I wanted to write for children and I wanted to write Indian stories for Indian children, not any stories. I said, I want to write Indian stories for Indian children so that not another generation of Indian kids does not grow up thinking somebody else has a better childhood. I have to show them that their life and their heritage and their history and their stories and their monsters. Why should all monsters be or good creatures be fairies and goblins and gnomes? We have our own. So their creatures are also fun, just as bizarre, just as cool. Uh, so I did decided then that I wanted to be a writer for Indian children, Indian stories. And at that time, it was when I also decided that my dream job would be to work in Target magazine. And I 
held on to that desire through engineering college. And I moved to Delhi only because I wanted to work with Target Magazine. And I applied and in Target Magazine, it was a tiny, tiny office and a tiny uh, group of people bringing it out. The, the magazine was so lovely that I never realized that it was only that many people bringing out the entire magazine. And wow. there were only, only three people writing editorial, only three writing the entire magazine. And nobody ever quit Target. Okay, those three people were always there. But when I, the day I walked into the Target office to ask for a job, just a week before that, one of the three had quit because she was married to somebody in the army and her husband had got transferred and she didn't usually travel with him to whichever station he was transferred to, but she had decided this time to travel with him and she had quit her job. And therefore there was a position, of course they interviewed me, there were other people who applied, etc. but I got the job. But that has always made me feel since then that the truth of that if you truly, truly want something and let the universe know it and work towards it, the universe will conspire to make it happen for you. I mean, it was just too weird wow. how that happened. That <laughs> just, just, yeah. So I, I got astonished. my dream job. <laughs> got my dream job, worked there for two or three years, learned so much about how to write for children from a wonderful editor there called Vatsala. That's like all Banerjee. So yeah, that that was how my target days were. It was it was brilliant. Really enjoyed myself there. <laughs> this is amazing. How was your experience with the uh, travel trends? Ah, so <laughs> after about two and a half years with Target, my husband uh, was going to move to London here for a year. He had an assignment in London and was going to move for a year. So that was too good an opportunity to miss. So when I left, I began to scout around asking various magazines, would you like me to write for you? I'm going to London. Would you like me to write for you? And Travel Trends was one of those magazines. Uh, and they said, oh, it's a, we are a travel magazine. So sure, write for us, write about some places in London, in and around London, about tourism, you know, what to see if an Indian tourist goes to London, where to eat, where can you find vegetarian food? Like there are so many stories for that a travel magazine can use, especially if somebody is already there. Otherwise, you have to send somebody there as a reporter, but somebody's already there. So I had the most, had the best time. So, you know, I got to go on what are called FAM trips, familiarization trips, which tourism departments organize for travel journalists so that they can go experience a place and then write about it. So they would organize sightseeing tours, hotels, nice boutique hotels to stay at so that you can write about the hotel. They would treat you to great food. And all of this was free for a travel journalist. Wow. You would take it so that they would give them the royal red carpet treatment so that then you would be able to write about it. Travel Trends said, yes, you can go on familiarization trips. And, you know, definitely it's a standard practice. Everybody takes people on trips like this. And it's, it's I mean, it's a... Everybody gets something out of it. It's a win-win situation for the tourism department. It's a win-win situation for us. And it's a win-win situation for the readers because they get to know about new places. So it's good for everyone. So I was like, okay. So I, in that one year that I was in England, how much I traveled in, in the UK, we, traveled. we just got to see so much of it and all, you know, as a guest of the UK tourism department. So it was very nice, good fun. <laughs> Amazing. Then I, from there, I wrote to a lot of Indian publications like Femina and okay. uh, Business Today, uh, various kinds of publications in India saying, hey, I'm here and I'm a writer and I can write stories for you. If there's anything you want me to cover, I'm already here. I can go do it. And many people said, sure. And they said, send us some ideas. I sent them ideas. They said, yeah, that works. So I ended up becoming a very uh, established freelance journalist in that time. I would go find stories, write about them for Indian publications. They would publish it. They would pay me. And I was having a good time because I got that way. I got to know London very well because I got to go and interview people, meet people, you know, travel to uh, parts of London that I wouldn't have otherwise in search of a story. So right. yeah, it was a very lovely time. Enjoyed myself. <laughs> so what is it that inspired you or still inspires you? 
everything. I mean, I think children, I mean, the I, I, children inspire me in the sense that I would, I always want to write stories, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, that a child can enjoy. Uh, so if it's a difficult concept in science or math or philosophy, like the Gita or the Vedas and Upanishads, I would like to be the person who breaks it down and explains it to them in a very contemporary voice without preaching, without making it about religion or anything, just to bring them the wisdoms of these great texts uh, in a way that they can use it in their lives. And if they are, if I'm able to talk about some subject as boring as economics to a child and the child is sitting there listening, then I feel my day has been worthwhile, <laughs> you know. So you're that's, amazing. That's, that's what inspired me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what does it take to write a book? Like what is your routine of writing and what how do you choose oh. what genre to write about? Mm. So I have always I've been always interested in both fiction and nonfiction, in writing fiction and nonfiction. And again, I think Target is to Target is responsible for that. Because Target magazine also carried a lot of nonfiction, like, you know, about science or sports or something. Not necessarily only creative writing fiction, not just stories, okay. but uh, facts written in a fun and easy way so that kids would understand. Or maybe political information, like, you know, what is the conflict between Israel and Palestine? Write about, like, you know, we would write things like that also so that children would understand. Uh, so I think my love for writing nonfiction for children also started in Target. Uh, but in the beginning, of course, I always want to write fiction. So, I mean, I wrote a lot of short stories and then I wrote the books, uh, the uh, series, my series called Tara Knots, Tara. Tara Knots, which is India's first ever fantasy adventure series for children in English. <laughs> so I, like I always say, uh, there are eight books in the series because J.K. Rowling wrote seven, so one had to do better than that. So, <laughs> so Tara Knotts is eight books. And uh, uh, yeah, so that was fun. But again, that whole that Tara Knotts is sort of the culmination of the idea that took root in my head when I first came across Target magazine, when I told myself I want to write Indian stories for Indian children. So Tara Knotts is based in a parallel universe called Mithya. So this is the first book, the first book in the series, Tarana. Wow. And <laughs> this is the map of the universe where all the action happens. Uh, they are called the Mithya Kins because people of Mithya are called Mithya Kos and the children of Mithya are called Mithya Kins. And uh -huh. these three, uh, through the eight books, have to rescue the 32 Tara sons, which have been captured by the evil villain Shah Pazur. And oh. what he has done is he has, uh, there are eight worlds in Mithya and on each of the eight worlds, he's hidden four riddles. And these children, uh, Tara Nauts, have to go to each of the worlds, locate those riddles, retrieve the riddles, crack the riddles. And every time they crack a riddle, one Tara son goes free. And they have very limited time in which to do all this. It's so much fun writing these eight books and dreaming up, uh, constructing these riddles for the Tara Knots to solve. And of course, every young reader of this book can also attempt those riddles and try to solve them themselves. Um, so, and creating all these magical fantasy creatures, which have nothing like any Western creature that you have read of. And actually come, a lot of it comes from Indian mythology and, uh, you know, just, so it so Tara Knots was my culmination of that kind of thing. So once I had done those books, I was sort of fictioned out. I said, my God, I can't think of any new exciting ideas for fiction, I think. So I wanted a break. And then I was thinking, now what should I write about? And that's when I decided to go back to a subject that I knew a lot about because I had done my engineering, which is science. <laughs> okay. So I wrote a book called uh, What If the World Stops Spinning and 24 Other Mysteries of Science. Wow. Okay, so, and that time when I was writing, that was actually the first time I understood a lot of the science I'd studied in high school. Because now I was <laughs> researching it without fear uh -huh. of an exam. I get that. Uh, 
and then then science was so interesting and uh, yeah again i wanted children to not be fearful of science so i wrote uh, that book and then then i said hey this writing non fiction is a lot of fun uh and i said okay now what now what and again i was thinking at the end of it what i write next what i write next and my editor the same editor who worked with me for tara knots right okay so i'm about to i must tell you about that so i had quit target to go off to london and then i had my children then i was I had moved to the us for a while uh by the time i came back to india it was like 2004 and by the time i started writing again for my son was little he was born in 2002 so you know by the time he was 3 or 4 i began to write again and uh, i had written a story for a children's magazine that my editor my very first editor in target magazine she came across it we had been out of touch for some 10 years she read the story of mine in a children's magazine some other children's magazine target had closed down by this time and she contacted me and she said hey you know what i've just taken over as editorial director of a publisher called hashet of the children's book division and i read your story and i loved it and i want you to write for me and she made me write these books eight books i had not written a single book for children at the end this allowed me to write eight books so for me that that thing about me walking into the target office and finding that job it finally culminated in me writing tara knots because it's the same editor it, it, it's it's quite crazy anyway she got in touch with me again i mean after tara knots i was like now what i've finished the science book now i don't know what to write she said come on come on write something for me and i'm like i don't have any ideas and she said hey i have the best idea for you and i said yeah please tell me because i really do want to write something except i don't know what to write about and i'm i'm open to all kinds of ideas and she said you know why don't you write and i'm like waiting with bated breath okay what 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 and she's saying why don't you write the bhagavad gita for children i'm like just wait a minute uh, you know what makes you think i know anything about the bhagavad gita what makes you think that i will be able to write about such a difficult book for children what makes you think children would want to read this book it's the most boring i mean it's the kind of book that only grandparents read why would i want to write it for children you know i had so many uh, objections to it and a lot of it came out of fear because i said my god there are people who go for geeta classes for years and they still say we are un we unpeeling one layer second layer etc and i have no i have not even read that book once and you're telling me to write a book about it for children like no so there was a lot of fear and also a lot of doubt i said you know one hears that some of these ancient indian texts are very sexist they are very patriarchal they are very casteist you know uh, and i don't want to uh, translate or write about a book like that for children uh, i wouldn't want them to have any and if, if if it actually contains such things i don't want to pretend they don't exist and not write about them because one has to be honest and tell children and i just kept saying no 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 so doubt and fear was plaguing my mind and i just didn't want to even touch it okay i was and six months she pursued me i have no idea why she was so clear that i should write it but she just pursued me and pursued me and i kept giving so many excuses then finally she said boss i've had enough of you she said if you haven't have you read the book so i said no i never have so as she said then i want you to read it you know before you keep saying no 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 first read it at least and then tell me no with some knowledge of what it contains how can you imagine that it's difficult imagine that it's for our older people imagine that it may be a terrible book i don't want to write about it, it may say some horrible things she said why don't you read it first and she said isn't that fair so i said yes that's fair i think i should read it before i reject it and i didn't even have a copy of the book i never grew up in a home that had a copy of the gita so i had to go find one from an aunt aunt in law actually my husband's aunt because in my house nobody used to read the gita so uh she uh, had she she was a, she's a very fun person and uh, she's been a teacher all her life so she knows how to talk about things and she had a and she knew the gita very well and so she said yeah sure come i'll tell you about it and then 
just one session we had. She had a mind map. She said, chapter one is this, chapter two is this, like, you know what? She told me just a few things. And then one thing she said really stuck. She said, and you know that Krishna and Arjuna are best friends, right? Uh, and I said, really? No, I didn't know that. Because <laughs> I always thought Krishna was, I mean, Arjuna was some devotee and Krishna was this god. Like, I, I very, very unequal. Like, so I said, no, I didn't know they were friends. And she said, no, they were best friends. And then something clicked. And I said, so basically the Gita is a conversation between two best friends, the entire Gita. And she said, yes, if you put it that way, that's exactly what it is. And I said, oh, I can write that for children. I mean, I can make that a fun, I mean, if, if it's not a terrible book, I can definitely, you know, it suddenly it stopped being some religious thing that was kept on this pedestal that nobody could touch and we all have to be reverential. No, it's a conversation between two friends. That's all. And what, just one friend was a little wiser than the other. And the other friend was very confused and uh, fearful. And that friend, the other, the wise friend, put him out of his misery by giving him a few life lessons. That's what it is. So I said, okay, then I will attempt it. To attempt to read it and she gave me her copy and uh, of course i can't i uh, couldn't have understood it in sanskrit so she gave me a copy of some commentaries three or four of her favorite commentaries on the on the gita and she sent me home said you why don't you do this and then we'll meet again after 10 15 days and we'll you know go a little deeper in and i started reading a commentary by dr radha krishnan who was a, the president of our country in the very beginning mm -hmm. right after independence and by the time I reached the second chapter, I was so hooked that I never went back to that aunt. I just read by myself. And when my editor called saying, very hesitantly, so does it say terrible things? Are you, is it only for old people? What do you think? Do you think you can do it? Is it worth doing? And I am like, turned a full 180 degrees by then. I was like, my God, what are you asking? Of course I should write. Of course everyone should know about it. I'm so upset that I have grown up without reading this great work of wisdom. And it's so secular and so lovely. And it doesn't say one terrible thing about anything. You know, it, it really changed my perspective on so many things. Just reading it once. And I said, no, no, of course I'm going to write. And she's like, oh, hooray. <laughs> Let's do this. Yes, splendid. Let's do this. And that's how I wrote the Gita for children. And in India, it's, the Gita is a living, breathing text. A lot of people feel very, very close to it, very devoted to it. So you can't take liberties with it. You can't be disrespectful. You can't misinterpret, you know, people are watching and they will. So I was like, and you re people really will get hurt if you don't do it properly. So, uh, like when the book was about to come out, I really wanted to go into a bunker and not come out for the next two months so that everybody's anger would be over by then and, you know, uh, stuff like that. But of course, we got it uh, read by a few experts before we dared to publish it. And the experts, uh, Dr. Bibek Debroy, a great scholar of Sanskrit, uh, he had said it was very good and yes, it must be published. And all that. But, you know, I said that is one person. India is 1.3 billion people with 1.3 billion opinions. So, you know, you can't really be sure of anything. But just to my great surprise and my great gratitude, the book just was embraced by everybody. It did so well and continues to do well and uh, so beloved to so many people. So. I was just feel very blessed about that. And my this is how, I think this was the culmination with Vatsala. My journey with her started in Target Magazine. She pushed me to do this, you know, with that great belief in me. And I always say at interviews and everything that she's my Krishna. She took my chariot to this middle of the scary- Oh, that's adorable. Sorry. <laughs> yes. You took, took me to the center of this battlefield and said, I'm sorry, you have to fight. You have to write. I'm telling you, do it. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was so that then what the Gita did for me was writing the Gita. It gave me the courage to take up topics to write about that I knew nothing about. And it taught me that if you have faith and if you go into a topic with an open mind, with no preconceived notion, no prejudices and say to whichever topic, speak to me. It probably will. If you go with a with a attitude of humility and an open mind that I don't know anything, teach me to any book or any subject. So the next 
book I picked up immediately. She wanted me to write the Vedas and Upanishads next because the Gita did so well and was so well loved. I'm like, excuse me, I'm not some Rupa Ma. I'm not sitting, you know, I'm not only going to write about such things. Like, you know, I have had so many interests. I want to write about other stuff. So very wisely, she said, okay, you do what you like, you know, I won't bother you. <laughs> and then I said, let, let me pick up some other subject that I know nothing about, but I should know about. I mean, I feel really dumb not knowing this, but somehow I don't know. So I looked around for subjects. I thought economics. I know nothing about economics at all. And there's an entire newspaper called the Economic Times, which I can't understand at all. And how foolish does that make me feel? So I said, OK, let me write a book on economics. So I started reading up about economics and I wrote a book about economics for children. Wow. And no, no, not willing to go back to Vedas and all yet. So I wrote a book on life skills for children called Ready 99 Must Have Skills for the World Conquering Teenager and Almost Teenager. So uh, I did that. Then I wrote a book on history called uh, Krishna Devaraya, King of Kings. This is a King of Karnataka. This is lovely. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful illustration. So I did that. And but, you know, somehow uh because i had done the gita and had enjoyed myself so much doing it and i knew that the gita was actually a distillation of all the wisdoms contained in even older texts called the upanishads so mm -hmm. I've always been curious always been curious since i wrote the gita i wonder what the upanishads say from which uh, vyasa took out just these few gems for the gita what else did they say and how did he pick these you know, to put in the Gita. So this was, as a writer, I was curious, you know, how did he edit the Upanishads to write there? And after writing three books on different subjects, I said, I finally called us. I said, okay, now I'm ready. I'm ready to write about, I'll go back to Vedas and Upanishads back. And I wrote the Vedas and Upanishads for children, another book. Uh, and then, and then again, somebody approached me, Penguin, and they said, write about any topic that you like. And I was like, what can I write about? And the other topic that had always fascinated me was medicine because my sister's a doctor and lots of doctors okay. in my family. So they always talk about uh, medicine a lot. Uh, so I told them, Let, shall I write about the history of medicine? And they're like, really? For children? Why will any child be interested in the history of medicine? And I was like, no, it's damn interesting, actually. There's, there's so many fascinating stories. I said, okay, if you're confident, sure. Why don't you write it? So I wrote that book and the, the tone I took through that book was like, my God, how much work we've done, how much we have figured out in the last 150 years, what, what we were 150 years ago till now, we have come so far ahead. Now we're at the top of our game. And that came out in September, 2019. And five yeah. months later, the pandemic struck. <laughs> You realize how little you know, actually. You know? Yeah. But it also, like I keep telling children when I talk about the medicine book, what it made me feel was that we have experienced, the world has experienced so many pandemics, so many disasters like this, health disasters in the past. And always there has been one or more people who figured out a way to get out of it. Some vaccine was invented, oh. some medicine was invented. Uh, and we figured it out. So I used to tell children in the beginning of the pandemic, we'll figure it out. There'll be a vaccine. Something good will happen. You know, of course, it'll have to get a lot worse before it gets better, but it will get better. So you have to keep that in your mind and stay safe until it gets better. So yeah, those are the books I've written. And then the Soman is a uh, supermodel and he's a runner and he's a, you know one of those extreme sportsmen yeah and uh, yeah so that was the latest book I did last year was uh, his memoir which he didn't want to write he wanted to tell me about his life and I wrote okay. it like in association with him yeah so that was my last that was again a very different so now what my thing is is every time I try to choose a very different genre of writing uh, because yeah. I think it, everything in the world, every subject is so fascinating. So it doesn't make sense to me to stick to the same thing every time to do one more in the same genre. So instead, I'd la rather explore a completely different subject. So that's what I've been doing so far. I would, what are the few mistakes that you've made all through your journey as an author? You know, I don't. 
I don't like to I don't like to think of anything as a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's just something that happens. You make a wrong decision, perhaps, and something happens. But it's if you make that mis if you make that wrong decision also after with with your heart in the right place. What the outcome of that decision is is really not in your hands. So there's no point feeling regret and remorse about what you did wrong. Wrong. Who says it's wrong? Everything that you do is an experience. Helps you to know yourself better. What is good for you? What is bad for you? So if you think of all success and failure and good decisions and bad decisions and right things and mistakes as just pure experiences, all of them teaching you something about yourself and about the world then you're in a happy place. Only if you say, ah, that was a huge success. That I did wrong. Why? <laughs> wow. You learn something. Every time, every time you do anything, <laughs> you learn from it. So I wouldn't say I've made any mistakes. How I'm, <clears throat> I think my only, what was holding me back for a long time was fear that I thought that I could only do this much and I didn't want to try anything different because you're always a little fearful of if, I, if, I, if it doesn't go well, if, I, if, uh, if people don't like this book, uh, if if I don't get as many likes on Facebook, if I don't like, get as many, you know, retweets on Twitter, like, you know, that's what you're scared of, those kinds of things. Um, but once you realize that whatever you do, you don't do it for others. You do it because you have examined yourself and you think it's important to do this work. Then, you know, the fear goes away. I'm doing it for myself. If at the end of writing this book, even if only three people ever read it in their lives, I have learned so much by writing Brilliant. this book. I have grown so much. So that that's already a win. You know, there, there yeah. can be no failure. Then. Brilliant. And no fear because you learn something. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, you've written so many genres and what is one thing that interested you the most that you've learned so far? You've learned many, but one that interested you the most. So each has been interesting in its own way, yeah. of course, in a very different way. Very, very, very lovely experience working on each of them. But I think what I, what I would say was most surprising mm -hmm. for me. If you had told me when I was 18 or something that, you know, you will find medicine. Medicine is probably an interesting subject. Economics is probably an interesting subject. I would have said, yeah, perhaps. I'm sure. And if I, I know that if I read up medicine, that'll be, I'll find it because I've always been a trivia buff. I like to find out about things. And so I would always have said, yes, yes, it, it could be interesting. I'm sure it's interesting. But if anyone had told me that you will find Indian philosophy interesting or engaging, uh, I would have said, nah, I don't think so. Indian mythology, yes, for sure. Indian mythology is fantastic story. The Ramayana, all the, you know, every story in mythology, I love to bits. But Indian philosophy, like scripture, Vedas, Upanishads, nah, I can't. First of all, I won't be interested in that and definitely I won't understand it. And it's just uh -huh. not for me, <laughs> is what I would have said. But for me, the most surprising thing, the most surprising book I've done for myself uh, is the Gita for children, that was the first one. Uh, and I'm amazed at how much it engaged me, how much it spoke to my core as an Indian. Uh, because we, I think we all, we all uh, live by the spirit of the Gita in, in our idioms, in different languages, in whatever language, how we approach life, our worldview, how we look at uh, life and death and karma and everything is, 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 common across all Indians and all those ideas come originally from books from texts like the Gita and then the Upanishads before them. That's so bewildering. At some very DNA level it resonates with you when you read it and you feel like happy that it's all been said so clearly there is no doubt anymore you know so uh, I think yeah mm -hmm. that was that is what I would say was my most surprising discovery about myself in this journey. And that once I have plunged into it, there is no, seems to be no way I can extricate myself from that. I've already 
always thinking of what else, which other scripture will I take and, you know, try to uh, find out its lessons and its wisdoms and pass it on to children. So it's a fascinating subject for me. What one advice you would give to the budding authors? Ah, this is my favorite question because two rules, two pieces of advice. The first rule is read, read, read. And the second rule is write, write, write. Because mm -hmm. you can keep reading and reading. Uh, and then if you never actually write, try it, experiment, fail, start again, actually finish a story, then hate that story and start again, work on that story, improve it, make it better until you're satisfied with it, unless you keep writing. So it's like a practice, like anything, anything in the world, whether it's math or singing or sports, you just get better at it with practice. And writing also requires practice. It won't, it suddenly, you know, nobody is like so talented that, or such a genius that they can just sit down and write off a book. Maybe there are a few people like that, but I, I don't know many like that. Uh, most of the writers I know and I've read about have put in blood, sweat, toil, and tears. You have to sit and work on it and work on it and fine tune it and hone the craft. And then you will yourself know when you reach the stage, say, man, I wrote that, it's lovely. You know, you have to <laughs> reach that feeling of that quiet pride that I don't care whether anyone reads it or not. I know that this is good. So, so writing is very important, but just writing without reading is also quite pointless. I mean, you have to read, you have to let a number of different voices get, enter into your head. You have to let them live their rent free talking, talking, talking all the time to each other. And you're saying, man, I love that register. I like this tone. I like that character. I love the complexity in that. And all of that somehow when you're sleeping and growing up, it will synthesize itself into a quite unique product that is you, that becomes your voice. And you practice that voice by writing, writing, writing. And one day you'll be a writer and you cannot stop that even when you have a book published or a story you keep reading and you keep writing you keep reading and you keep writing that's the only way that's the only advice <laughs> lovely <laughs> thank you for being with us here thank you good